Principles of Mathematics Part 1 The Indefinables of Mathematics Chapters 1 to 5 This is the first video in a series of videos which I'll gradually be putting together covering some of the contents of Bertrand Russell's 1903 book The Principles of Mathematics. My aim in these videos is to try to pick out some of the main arguments and themes from the book. Having said that, these videos are not some kind of brief introduction to the principles of mathematics. Even in summary form, there's a lot of ground to cover. There will therefore be many gaps that can only be properly filled by reading the book yourself. These videos on the principles of mathematics are partly for my own selfish benefit in the sense that I'm making them as a way to help clarify some of my own thoughts about Russell's principles of mathematics. However, I'm happy to make my thoughts available to others through these videos but I have no expectation that these videos will serve any useful purpose for anyone else. If they do, then so much the better. Of course, these videos don't necessarily require that you have any prior familiarity with Principles of Mathematics, and nor do you need to be reading Principles of Mathematics alongside these videos, though I would expect that these videos will be of most use to those who want to read, or who have already read Principles of Mathematics in whole or in part. As far as I know, Principles of Mathematics is freely available for download from the internet since, at least the first edition, is in the public domain. Nevertheless, I'll put a link in the description for this video to the digital copy that I've been using. The Principles of Mathematics is a relatively long and very dense book, and so it stands to reason that I've necessarily had to leave some parts out of these videos. I'll try to cram in as much as I can into the videos, but obviously I've got to draw the line somewhere, and there will be some regrettable omissions. The Principles of Mathematics, despite the title, is not a book covering the basics of mathematics. It's an investigation into the foundations of mathematics, and more specifically, an investigation into whether purely logical principles can provide a foundation for mathematics. It's not by any means an easy read. I've personally found it very difficult to wade through this book, and I cannot in all honesty claim to understand everything in it. There are some parts which are very philosophical in nature, and only having a smattering of philosophy myself made these parts all the more difficult to read. Someone with a much stronger background in philosophy may possibly find it an easier read. The Principles of Mathematics is not attempting to describe how mathematics is done or was done at the time of writing, nor is it trying to prescribe a way for mathematics to be done. It's simply an attempt to find a suitable theoretical basis for mathematics and Russell has chosen to pursue a foundation based in logic. If you do read Principles of Mathematics, I'd strongly recommend that you be prepared to read and reread certain sections. Some parts of the book make much more sense when you've read some chapters a bit further on. So although, like many books, Principles of Mathematics builds on earlier stuff, sometimes ideas are introduced informally, and only some chapters later do these ideas get a full explanation. This is inevitable in many cases, and so, it may not be appropriate to try to read it in a purely forwards direction. While reading this book, it may be worth bearing in mind that, at the time of its writing, investigations into the relationship between mathematics and logic were still a fairly new thing. The Principles of Mathematics is, therefore, a very experimental work. It may strike the reader that some of the things discussed seem to be wholly irrelevant to mathematics, and this may be the case, as things developed over the 20th century, and the links between logic and mathematics became clearer in some cases, then possibly it became evident that some things were worth pursuing while other things were not. Therefore, there are some things in Principles of Mathematics that, from a modern perspective, may seem unusual to discuss in relation to mathematics or logic. And I want to take the work as it is, for the most part, and deal with what is actually there on the pages, and I don't want to try to limit myself to what I deem to be relevant from a modern viewpoint. I won't be trying to give a critique of principles of mathematics, I'll simply be trying to present the main ideas and provide some clarification where I think it's appropriate to do so. I'm aware that the ideas in this book are no longer current, and have been shown to be erroneous by later authors. I'll make brief mentions here and there of some of the ways in which principles of mathematics has been subsequently shown to be incorrect, but these will be usually very brief mentions. I want to try to take Principles of Mathematics as it is, and try to understand its contents from the perspective of the author at or around the time of writing. I can't guarantee the completeness or correctness of the contents of these videos. I'm not a scholar, and I make these videos because I enjoy making them, and want to make these works more accessible to other people,
However, if you do notice anything wrong with what I say, then I'll be very happy to receive constructive criticism and be corrected. Chapter 1. Definition of Pure Mathematics In this chapter, as the title suggests, Russell lays out his ideas about what mathematics ultimately is. This chapter is definitely worth spending some time on in order to get a feel for how Russell, at least at the time of writing The Principles of Mathematics, viewed mathematics. Understanding his perspective may help to appreciate the reasons for him discussing certain topics further down the line which, at first glance, may seem quite unusual to cover. Naturally, this being the first chapter, there are some things that may not be entirely clear, things like formal implication in section 5 and class in section 8. These terms will receive full explanations in due course, though, and as long as you're prepared to sometimes go back to reread bits, then eventually things will start to fall into place. So Russell wastes no time getting straight to the point, indeed in the opening sentences he writes, Pure mathematics is the class of all propositions of the form P implies Q, where P and Q are propositions containing one or more variables. The same in the two propositions, and neither P nor Q contains any constants except logical constants. In addition to these, logical constants, mathematics uses a notion which is not a constituent of the propositions which it considers, namely the notion of truth. In the introduction to the second edition, Russell writes on some of his objections concerning his own definition of pure mathematics, written some 34 years earlier. He says, In this definition various changes are necessary. To begin with, the form P implies Q is only one of the many logical forms that mathematical propositions may take. And he continues, Next, when it is said that P and Q are propositions containing one or more variables, it would of course be more correct to say that they are propositional functions. And finally he says, I come next to a more serious matter, namely the statement that neither P nor Q contains any constants except logical constants. My present point is that the absence of non-logical constants, though a necessary condition for the mathematical character of a proposition, is not a sufficient one following which Russell goes on to give an example to illustrate this final objection. So we see therefore that Russell had changed his mind to a certain extent on his definition of pure mathematics by the time of the second edition. Does this mean then that the first few lines of Principles of Mathematics actually undermine the rest of the book? Well possibly, but 34 years is quite a long time to have to think about something and to come to see things differently and hopefully with more clarity than 34 years earlier. I don't think it's surprising that Russell had changed his mind on some things, and considering that the relationship between logic and mathematics was only just beginning to attract serious attention in 1903, when the first edition appeared, then I think to read Principles of Mathematics, written well over a hundred years ago, in the very first years of a century which was to see mathematics and logic dramatically change, and expect it to be 100% correct may be a tad unreasonable. Even if the incorrect definition makes some parts of Principles of Mathematics ultimately irrelevant, there's still much to learn from the book in my opinion. I certainly have taken a lot from this book despite this incorrect definition, but, of course, I had to decide to just go ahead and read the book in the first place to find out whether or not I was actually going to learn anything from it. So I'll be going forward in these videos with the original definition of pure mathematics in mind where appropriate, and trying to see things from the perspective of Russell as he was writing this book. Through this definition of pure mathematics, Russell is making it very clear that he believes that mathematics has a logical foundation. Mathematics is reducible to purely logical principles and therefore, mathematics is nothing more than a branch of logic. In section 4 Russell says, The fact that all mathematics is symbolic logic is one of the greatest discoveries of our age. And he also states in section 10, The fact is that, when once the apparatus of logic has been accepted, all mathematics necessarily follows. There is, however, some distinction between mathematics and logic, which Russell explains in section 10 as follows. The distinction of mathematics from logic is very arbitrary, but if a distinction is desired, it may be made as follows. Logic consists of the premises of mathematics, together with all other propositions, which are concerned exclusively with logical constants, and with variables, but do not fulfil the above definition of mathematics in section 1. Mathematics consists of all of the consequences of the above premises which assert formal implications containing variables, together with such premises themselves as have these marks. The so-called logicist thesis was not a brand new thing at the start of the 20th century. Indeed, the idea of a reduction of mathematics to logic can be traced back in some form to Leibniz, 
However, I've already made a video giving a brief and non-technical outline of the history of logicism, and so I won't go into any more detail on it here. It's also well to note that Russell, as we see in section 5, does not believe that mathematics, and by this is referring to pure mathematics, is in any way concerned with the nature of actual space and so on. Euclidean geometry and non-Euclidean geometry are both part of pure mathematics according to Russell, and within pure mathematics both are equally true. But pure mathematics is not at all concerned with the question of whether actual space is Euclidean or non-Euclidean. This is a matter for applied mathematics and empirical observation. Therefore, it's senseless to ask, in the context of pure mathematics, whether the results of pure mathematics are an accurate reflection of reality. In addition to the definition of pure mathematics given at the start of this chapter, Russell further characterises pure mathematics and the propositions of pure mathematics as follows. The typical proposition of mathematics is of the form phi xyz implies psi xyz, whatever values xyz and so on may have, where phi xyz and psi xyz for every set of values of x, y, z are propositions. In section 7 we see, in every proposition of pure mathematics, when fully stated, the variables have an absolutely unrestricted field. Any conceivable entity may be substituted for any of our variables, without impairing the truth of our proposition. And finally Russell says in section 8, so long as any term in our proposition can be turned into a variable, our proposition can be generalised, and so long as this is possible, it is the business of mathematics to do it. For anyone familiar with Principia Mathematica, some of these comments clearly conflict with the theory of types presented in that work. It seems obvious then that Russell wrote this before developing the theory of types. In the theory of types it's true that we deal with unrestricted variables when it comes to formal implications and so on, but the variables are only unrestricted in relation to a particular type, that is, the variable is not absolutely unrestricted. There are many more examples scattered throughout this chapter that could be given indicating what Russell believed pure mathematics is and what it is not. Indeed, in section 9 can be seen some further details of Russell's views concerning the relationship between pure and applied mathematics, but I think I've said enough on that here, so I'll end the part of this video covering chapter 1 with the following quote from section 2, where Russell says, The nature of number, of infinity, of space, time and motion, and of mathematical inference itself are all questions to which, in the present work, an answer professing itself demonstrable with mathematical certainty will be given. An answer which, however, consists in reducing the above problems to problems in pure logic. So on that note then, let's get going. Chapter 2. Symbolic Logic Here are a couple of quotes from this section which start to give an idea about what Russell means when he speaks of symbolic logic. In section 11 we see, Symbolic or formal logic is the study of the various types of deduction. The word symbolic designates the subject by an accidental characteristic. For the employment of mathematical symbols, here as elsewhere, is merely a theoretically irrelevant convenience. And in section 12, symbolic logic is essentially concerned with inference in general, and is distinguished from various special branches of mathematics by its generality. And also in section 12, what symbolic logic does investigate is the general rules by which inferences are made. Russell divides symbolic logic into three parts, the calculus of propositions, the calculus of classes, and the calculus of relations, each of which are briefly covered separately in this chapter. Part of this chapter is also concerned with Piano's symbolic logic, which I won't be covering, though I may briefly refer to this part if need be. Russell gives in the first part of this chapter the indefinables of symbolic logic. These are formal implication. This is an implication of the form phi x implies psi x for all values of x, where phi x and psi x are, for all values of x, propositions. Implication between propositions not containing variables, also known as material implication. The relation of term to a class of which it is a member. The notion of such that. The notion of relation and the notion of truth, and it would seem to me that the notion of propositional function should be added to this list, though Russell does not explicitly mention the notion of propositional function in his list in section 11. Starting from indefinable notions, further derivative notions can be defined in terms of the indefinable notions. Similarly, as we'll see, starting with the primitive propositions, further propositions can be deduced. Thus, the indefinable notions and primitive propositions form the starting points, 
Although the indefinable notions are not defined within the logical system, they can still be given informal explanations using natural language. But it must always be remembered that these informal explanations are not definitions. Indeed, some of the chapters in Principles of Mathematics are dedicated entirely to the explanations of these indefinable notions. For example, see Chapter 3 on Implication and Formal Implication. Even though the relation of a term to a class of which it is a member is taken as an indefinable, the notion of class is not taken as an indefinable, and much more will be said on classes later in Part 1. Russell also points out an important distinction in the first part of this chapter, which is definitely worth remembering. He says that a proposition is anything that is true or that is false. However, an expression such as x is a man, where x is a variable, is therefore not a proposition, for it is neither true nor false. If we give to x any constant value whatever, the expression becomes a proposition. It is a schematic standing for any one of a whole class of propositions. Indeed, x is a man, where x is a variable, is a propositional function. Note that the notion of proposition does not appear amongst the indefinables. We will see that Russell actually gives a definition of proposition in section 16. So let's have a look at part A of this chapter. Let's see what Russell has to say about what he considers the propositional calculus to involve. In section 14 we see, The propositional calculus is characterised by the fact that all its propositions have as hypothesis and as consequent the assertion of a material implication. And in section 15, our calculus studies the relation of implication between propositions. This relation must be distinguished from the relation of formal implication. Formal implication is also involved in this calculus, but is not explicitly studied. Material implication, which was just mentioned, is the type of implication between two propositions, as opposed to formal implication, which is a type of implication between propositional functions. Material implication will often be simply referred to as implication, though the type of implication involved should usually be clear from the context at any rate. In section 16, Russell remarks on the indefinability of implication. A definition of implication is quite impossible. But he goes on later to say, Although implication is indefinable, proposition can be defined. Every proposition implies itself, and whatever is not a proposition implies nothing. Hence to say, P is a proposition is equivalent to saying P implies P, and this equivalence may be used to define propositions. The propositional calculus requires only the two different kinds of implication as indefinable notions, but in addition to these indefinable notions are required some primitive propositions, which Russell numbers as 10 in total. These primitive propositions, given in section 18, are as shown on the screen. Note this in 1, we do not require P or Q to be propositions. Of course, they may indeed be propositions, but even in the case where P and or Q are not propositions, P implies Q will still be a proposition. Proposition 4 is not capable of being reduced to a purely symbolic form, and Russell also defines the logical product of P and Q as follows. If P implies P, then if Q implies Q, PQ, the logical product of P and Q, means that if P implies that Q implies R, then R is true. I find this definition to be somewhat clunky. Therefore, I agree with Russell when he says that this definition is highly artificial. Logical addition is also defined in section 19 as follows. P or Q is equivalent to P implies Q implies Q. And finally, negation is defined as follows. Not P is equivalent to the assertion that P implies all propositions, i.e., that R implies R, implies P implies R, whatever R may be. Some of the primitive propositions have P implies P, and so on, among the hypotheses. This is because we give an unrestricted range to P, Q, R, and so on, which appear in the propositions, and therefore, it's possible that P, Q, and R, and so on, may sometimes be substituted with entities that are not propositions. We only want the above primitive propositions to hold in the case where P, Q, R and so on are substituted with actual propositions. As previously stated in section 16, propositions such as P implies P is equivalent to P is a proposition. The calculus of classes. The calculus of classes requires the fundamental or indefinable notions of the relation of an individual to a class to which it belongs, denoted epsilon the notion of propositional function, 
and the notion of such that. Some of what Russell says in this chapter regarding classes is covered in more detail in chapter 6, so to avoid too much repetition, I won't go into too much detail here about classes. I'll just try to mention the things relating to classes that appear in this chapter, but not in chapter 6. In section 22 we're told that phi x is a propositional function if, for every value of x, phi x is a proposition, determinate when x is given. And Russell says that a propositional function will in general be true for some values of the variable and false for others. The notion of such that allows us to speak of the values of x such that phi x is true. And of course this is not a definition of the notion of such that, but merely an informal explanation. Of these values of x for which phi x is true, Russell says that, in general, these values form a class, and in fact a class may be defined as all the terms satisfying some propositional function. There is, however, some limitation required in this statement, though I have not been able to discover precisely what the limitation is. Of course, Russell eventually went on to impose certain limitations on the possible values of propositional functions through the theory of types in Principia Mathematica. In addition to these fundamental notions, we also require two primitive propositions. The first asserts that if x belongs to the class of terms satisfying a propositional function phi x, then phi x is true. The second asserts that if phi x and psi x are equivalent propositional functions for all values of x, then the class of x as such that phi x is true is identical with the class of x as such that psi x is true. The definitions given in section 25 of logical products of a class of classes and logical sum of a class of classes do not require the class of classes involved to be finite. The definitions apply equally to a class of classes which is finite or infinite. Of course we don't have a formal notion of finite or infinite yet, but once these notions have been made precise, then these definitions will be seen to apply to both cases. The logical products of a class of classes is defined as follows. If k is a class of classes, its logical product is the class of terms belonging to each of the classes of k. And the definition of the logical sum of a class of classes is, if k is a class of classes, its logical sum is the class which is contained in every class in which every class of the class k is contained. And we also have the notion of existence of a class which is defined as follows. A class is said to exist when it has at least one term. Or more formally, a is an existent class when and only when any proposition is true provided x is an A always implies it whatever value we may give to x. In this definition, the proposition is understood to be an actual proposition and not a propositional function, and so if A is an existent class then it must have at least one term. Therefore the proposition x is an A will be true for at least one value of x. Now suppose we have x is an A implies P. Then if x is an A implies P, whichever value we give to x, then x is an A must imply P for all values of x, for which x is an A is false, as well as the values of x for which x is an A is true, of which there must be at least one such value of x. Therefore P must be a true proposition, otherwise x is an A implies P would be false for those values of x for which x is an A is true. If on the other hand we have x is an A is always false, whichever value of x we choose, then x is an A implies P will always be true whether P is a true proposition or a false proposition. It must be noted that the word existence here is simply a word that is being used to describe certain types of classes. As Russell points out, existence used in relation to classes must not be supposed to mean what existence means in philosophy. As we will see, the null class can be defined as the class which does not exist, and at first glance this seems strange because we're talking about something that doesn't exist as if it did exist. Well, in a way we are, but we understand that there is a thing called the null class, that is, the null class exists, but not in the sense as defined above. But the null class does not have the property of existence as defined in relation to classes. The Calculus of Relations in this section, Russell merely introduces some basic notions relating to relations. More detail regarding relations will be given in a later chapter. Russell has already accepted the notion of relation as a primitive notion in section 12, and this is supplemented with the primitive propositions x r y is a proposition for all values of x and y. 
Note that if R is a relation, then the symbol XRY is read X has the relation R to Y. Every relation has a converse, that is, if R is a relation such that XRY, then there is a relation R primed such that XRY is equivalent to Y R primed X for all values of X and Y. Between any two terms, there is a relation not holding between any two other terms. And Russell says in section 28 that this is the most important of the primitive propositions in this subject. The negation of a relation is a relation. The logical products of a class of relations, i.e. the assertion of all of them simultaneously, is a relation. The logical product of two relations, R and S, is the proposition XRY and XSY. The relative product of two relations is a relation. Material implication is a relation. And finally, epsilon is a relation. The class of terms which have the relation R to some term or other is called the class of reference with respect to R, or domain. And the class of terms to which some terms has the relation R is called the class of relata with respect to R. Russell has already referred to the relation of implication in section 15 and the relation of an individual to a class to which it belongs in section 20. In both of these cases, the word relation is used in an informal sense, merely to provide an explanation of the meanings of the symbols implies and epsilon. Suppose that x has the relation r to y, and y has the relation s to z. Then x has a relation to z, and it is this relation that is called the relative product of r and s. And Russell speaks of an intentional view of relations in section 28, where he says that this view leads to the result that two relations may have the same extension without being identical. His solution to this, if we wanted to take a more extensional view of relations, is to suggest that we may replace a relation R by the logical sum or product of the class of relations equivalent to R, i.e. by the assertion of some or of all such relations, where two relations R and R primed are said to be equivalent if X R Y implies and is implied by X R primed Y for all values of x and y. It's indifferent whether we take the logical sum or logical product, since we're dealing with relations which are all equivalent. Therefore, they will always have the same truth value, whether all true or all false, and so the logical sum and logical product will, in this case, have the same truth value. An extensional view of relations would effectively look at the terms which are being related, and not at the relation itself. The relation would thus be determined purely by the classes of reference and relata, and no distinction will be made between two relations R and R primed, for which XRY implies and is implied by XR primed Y for all values of X and Y holds. The intentional view of relations thus takes into consideration the specific relation that is involved. And it may seem that the extensional view of relations has some advantages over the intentional view, but Russell decides against the extensional view for reasons explained in section 28. The subject of relations will be taken up in more detail in chapter 9, so I'll leave it there for now. The next section of this chapter, Piano Symbolic Logic, I won't be going through. The section discusses some of the details of Piano's system of symbolic logic which I'm not personally very familiar with. Chapter 3. Implication and Formal Implication Russell says near the start of this chapter, two kinds of implication, the material and the formal, were found to be essential to every kind of deduction. In the present chapter, I wish to examine and distinguish these two kinds, and to discuss some methods of attempting to analyse the second of them. Russell goes on further to say, in the discussion of inference, it's common to permit the intrusion of a psychological element, and to consider our acquisition of new knowledge by its means. But it is plain that, where we validly infer one proposition from another, we do so in virtue of a relation which holds between the two propositions, whether we perceive it or not. The mind, in fact, is as purely receptive in inference as common sense supposes it to be in perception of sensible objects. The relation in virtue of which it is possible for us validly to infer is what I call material implication. The psychological element that Russell mentions is somewhat cryptic, and I'm not entirely sure what he's referring to. What he seems to be getting at is that inferences are made by means of a certain objective relation which exists between propositions. We may not be aware of that relation, and we may not perceive it, 
But that doesn't mean that it's not there, in the same way that just because we don't perceive a particular object, then it doesn't mean that the object is not there. And it's through this relation alone that inference is possible, and any psychological reason that we may attribute to the process of inference is an intrusion. The first part of this chapter is discussing material implication with formal implication being dealt with later in the chapter. As probably anyone who has any experience with symbolic logic and propositional logic will be aware, implication, or material implication, in a purely logical sense, can be a bit unnerving initially when we discover, for example, that a false proposition implies any proposition, and a true proposition is implied by any proposition, which yield propositions such as lions are reptiles implies 1 plus 1 equals 2, and Mars is a planet implies Tyrannosaurus rex is extinct. Russell says that the reluctance to admit such implications can be explained by a preoccupation with formal implication, which is a much more familiar notion. I can't say that I entirely agree with this. My personal thoughts on this are that we somehow expect a more cause and effect relationship to exist between the antecedent and the consequent. Since we can't see how Mars being a planet would directly cause Tyrannosaurus rex to be extinct, we might tend to reject such an implication. We may also be conflating the idea of implication with inference, which are not the same thing. An implication may be a premise in an inference, but we cannot make an inference on the basis of an implication alone. Indeed, an implication may be true, and yet no inference can be made. For an inference to be made, we need a true premise. My thoughts here, however, are purely speculative, and I'm not saying that Russell is wrong. Implication between two propositions does not require any kind of cause or effect relationship. It's a purely formal relationship which exists between propositions which are supposed to have certain combinations of truth values, and only the truth values of the propositions are relevant, not the specific nature of the propositions involved. Of course, there may in some cases actually be a cause and effect relationship between the propositions, but this is merely an accidental and not necessary feature of that particular implication. Therefore, it must be understood that implies, in a formal logical sense, is not necessarily to be understood as attempting to accurately reflect the use of the word implies when used in a natural language setting. Russell says in section 37, In virtue of the general principles laid down in section C of the preceding chapter, there must be a relation holding between nothing except propositions, and holding between any two propositions of which either the first is false or the second is true. Of various equivalent relations satisfying these conditions, one is to be called implication. Russell moves on to discuss formal implication, which is a type of implication which is fundamentally different to material implication. Russell introduces an example. X is a man implies X is a mortal, in which neither X is a man nor X is a mortal is a proposition, but are in fact propositional functions, though it would seem not independent propositional functions. If X is a man implies X is a mortal, is to become a formal implication, for the reasons which Russell gives in section 41, the X must be allowed to range over all possible values of X. That is, X must not have some restricted range. Only with a completely unrestricted range for X can X is a man implies X is mortal become a formal implication. Thus we obtain the full proposition which is X is a man implies X is a mortal for all values of X. Of course, a completely unrestricted range for X will undergo some modification in Principia Mathematica when Russell realises that things need to be split up into types. I've already made some videos on Principia Mathematica and I'll be making some new videos which will gradually appear on my channel. Note that there's a distinction to be made between X is a man implies X is a mortal and X is a man implies X is a mortal for all values of X. The latter is an actual proposition, since it does not contain any real variables, but does contain an apparent variable. The former, however, does contain a real variable, and is in fact a propositional function. We can effectively restrict a variable, without actually restricting it, to propositions by inserting x implies x as a hypothesis. As Russell explains, only propositions can be implied and thus x implies x, will only be true whenever x is substituted with a specific value which happens to be a proposition. Again, this artificial way of unrestricting a variable will become redundant in Principia Mathematica.
So now going back to the example x is a man implies x is a mortal, we see that if x is replaced by some specific value a, which is not a man, then a is a man will be false. But the implication a is a man implies a is mortal will still be true. On the other hand, if x is replaced with b, where b is a man, then the implication again will be true. And therefore we see that x is a man implies x is a mortal is true for all values of x and no restriction is required. Russell says in section 41, we must therefore allow our x, wherever the truth of our formal implication is thereby unimpaired, to take all values without exception. And where any restriction on variability is required, the implication is not to be regarded as formal until the said restriction has been removed by being prefixed as hypothesis. The implies in x is a man implies x is a mortal, where x is a variable, is not a relation between propositions, since neither are propositions. Nor is it, according to Russell, a relation between propositional functions, since we are to understand x is a man implies x is a mortal as a single and evidently unanalyzable propositional function in and of itself. The formal implication such as x is a man implies x is a mortal for all values of x can be understood as a class of material implications. A is a man implies A is a mortal, B is a man implies B is a mortal, and so on. No one of which contains a variable, and we assert that every member of this class is true. Russell asks why it is that if Socrates is varied in Socrates is man implies Socrates is a mortal, then we always obtain a true implication, whereas if we vary Socrates in Socrates as a man implies Socrates as a philosopher, then we will obtain a false implication whenever Socrates is replaced with something that is a man, but not a philosopher. Russell puts forward two possible ways of dealing with this problem. However, before stating these ways, we need to note that Russell argues that propositions can be split into subject and assertion, where the assertion is something that is said about the subject. This will be covered in more detail in the next chapter, and it suffices to say here that the proposition, Socrates is a man, can be split into the subject, Socrates, and the assertion, is a man. Now the two possible ways of dealing with the aforementioned difficulty are, there is a relation between the two assertions, is a man, and is a mortal, in virtue of which when the one holds, so does the other. Or, we may analyse the whole proposition, Socrates is a man implies Socrates is mortal, into Socrates, and an assertion about him, and say that the assertion in question holds of all terms. Russell opts for the first of these two possibilities, though he admits that both ways have their problems. The problems arising from the first way seem less grave than those arising from the latter. And thus Russell accepts the view that a formal implication demands a particular relation to exist between the two assertions in the implication. Only when this relation exists can the variable have a completely unrestricted range, and hence a formal implication is the result. Chapter 4 Proper names, adjectives and verbs. I personally found chapter 4 a particularly difficult chapter to figure out. If your experience of reading principles and mathematics is anything like mine, then you might have to read through this a few times before it starts to make sense. Russell will focus in this chapter on three parts of speech which he says are specially important. They are substantives, adjectives and verbs. Substantives include proper names and are characterised by the fact that, amongst the different analyses of a proposition into subject and assertion, as outlined in the previous chapter, there must be at least one analysis in which the proper name is regarded as subject of the proposition, or of some subordinate constituent proposition. This, of course, does not suggest that a proper name will always be regarded as the subject, particularly if many proper names appear in the proposition. For example, the proposition a is greater than b can be analysed as either subject a assertion is greater than b or subject b assertion a is greater than. Among substantives there are also those which are derived logically but not etymologically from adjectives and verbs. The examples given are humanity derived from the adjective human and sequence derived from the verb follows. Adjectives and verbs are characterised by the fact that they can occur in some propositions where the adjective or verb is never the subject in any of the possible analyses of the proposition into subject and assertion. However, 
adjectives and verbs may occur as subjects in other propositions. For example, Socrates is human can be analysed in a single way. Russell notes in this chapter that subjects predicate propositions can only be analysed in a single way into subject and assertion. This single way is subject, Socrates, assertion, is human. Thus, since human does not occur as the subject of this particular proposition in any of its analyses, of which there is only one here anyway, then human is not a proper name, and so must be either an adjective or a verb, and clearly human is an adjective. In section 47, Russell says, Whatever may be an object of thought, or may occur in any true or false proposition, or can be counted as one, I call a term. I shall use as synonymous with it, term, the words unit, individual, and entity. The word constituent will be used as a generic word referring to any part of a proposition. Terms can be split into things and concepts, of which things are indicated by proper names and concepts are indicated by all other words. Concepts can be further subdivided into adjectives and verbs, where adjectives are often called predicates or class concepts, and verbs are almost always relations. Russell notes that adjectives give rise to classes, whereas verbs correspond to propositional functions. Predicates are concepts other than verbs, which occur in propositions having only one term, or subject. Moreover, predicates are distinguished among terms from other terms by the connection that they have to the notion of denoting, which will be the focus of the next chapter. Note that, although there may be a grammatical difference between two words, there may not be a logical difference. Thus, human and humanity denote the same concept, and we will see shortly that humanity is indeed a concept. Russell makes some interesting remarks concerning terms. He says, A term is, in fact, possessed of all of the properties commonly assigned to substances or substantives. Every term to begin with is a logical subject. Russell also says, Every term is immutable and indestructible. What a term is, it is, and no change can be conceived in it which would not destroy its identity and make it another term. And he goes on further to say, Another mark which belongs to terms is numerical identity with themselves, and numerical diversity from all other terms. Russell gives an example of two propositions which are equivalent yet distinct, to show that humanity denotes a concept. He uses the proposition, Socrates is human, and the equivalent proposition, humanity belongs to Socrates. We have to be conscious here that the grammatical difference between human and humanity does not reflect a logical difference. Russell goes on further to say, Terms which are concepts differ from those which are not, not in respect of self-subsistence, but in virtue of the fact that, in certain true or false propositions, they occur in a manner which is different in an indefinable way from the manner in which subjects or terms of relations occur. Russell finally discusses the verb in the last part of this chapter, and I personally found this part of the chapter the most difficult to understand, and was a part that I had to read several times before it started to become clear-ish. Although we've already remarked that a grammatical difference does not necessarily correspond to a logical difference, in the case of the verb, according to Russell, there is a grammatical difference which does correspond to a genuine logical distinction. Grammatically, the verb can occur in the role as verb, but also it can occur in the role of verbal noun. And Russell says that the former, a verb occurring as a verb, corresponds to an asserted proposition such as Caesar died. On the other hand, a verb occurring in the role of verbal noun corresponds to an unasserted proposition, such as might occur as a subordinate proposition, such as the death of Caesar, which may be made the subject of a proposition. Russell argues that, to avoid contradiction, the concept which occurs in the verb in the form of verb and the concept which occurs in the verb in form of verbal noun are the same concept or entity. He also says that there seems to be no possibility of maintaining that the logical subject which results is a different entity from the proposition. So what explains the difference between the asserted proposition, Caesar died, and the unasserted proposition, the death of Caesar? Russell says that this is down to the fact that Caesar died seems to contain its own truth or falsehood as an element, but the death of Caesar has an external relation to truth or falsehood. He goes on to say that there appears to be an ultimate notion of assertion given by the verb, 
which is lost as soon as we substitute a verbal noun, and is lost when the proposition in question is made the subject of some other proposition. Russell says, however, that he doesn't know how to satisfactorily deal with this problem. He says that, when a proposition happens to be true, it has a further quality over and above that which it shares with false propositions, and it is this further quality which is what I mean by assertion in a logical as opposed to a psychological sense. We're told towards the end of section 55 that one verb and only one verb must occur as verb in every proposition. Russell also makes an interesting claim that a proposition is a unity, and this unity is effectively destroyed upon analysis into its constituents. Something appears to be lost when a proposition undergoes such an analysis. In section 54 he says, A proposition, in fact, is a unity, and when analysis has destroyed the unity, no enumeration of constituents will restore the proposition. He says also that the verb, when used as a verb, embodies the unity of a proposition, and is thus distinguishable from the verb considered as a term. The example that Russell gives to show how the unity of a proposition is lost upon analysis is the proposition A differs from B. When this is analysed into A, difference and B, the unity of the original proposition seems to be lost. He concludes that the true solution to this difficulty seems to lie in the unity of the proposition, A differs from B, and this unity is destroyed when the proposition is analysed into its components. The relation differs is the exact same relation in each proposition in which it occurs, and thus does not have instances. How the relation of differs relates to two terms in the proposition is something that is only evident through the unity of the proposition. Russell says, owing to the way in which the verb actually relates the terms of a proposition, every proposition has a unity which renders it distinct from the sum of its constituents. And of course this applies to all relations. Every verb may be regarded as a relation. Therefore, relations of verbs do not have instances which are the exact same relation in each proposition. Chapter 5. Denoting. Russell explains near the beginning of this chapter that a concept denotes when, if it occurs in a proposition, the proposition is not about the concept, but about the term connected in a certain peculiar way with the concept. And we also see the fact that description is possible that we are able, by the employment of concepts, to designate a thing which is not a concept, is due to a logical relation between some concepts and some terms, in virtue of which such concepts inherently and logically denote such terms. When a concept denotes, then the proposition in which the concept occurs is not about the concept, but about whatever may or may not be denoted by the concept. For example, all cats are mammals is not about the concept all cats. That is, the proposition is not about the words, all cats, but is about whatever is denoted by all cats. However, the proposition, all cats is an utterance of two words, is about the actual words, all cats, and not what all cats denotes. Of course, the latter example is quite unnatural in many ways, but not impossible. But it would normally be clear from the context whether the proposition was about the words, all cats, or what is denoted by all cats. A denoting phrase, as we will see when it denotes, denotes neither a concept nor a term, but denotes certain combinations of terms, depending on the specific nature of the denoting phrase involved. And Russell points out six words which are of particular importance to the theory of denoting. They are all, every, any, a, some, and the. According to Russell, a denoting phrase always consists of a class concept preceded by one of these six words. These six words, along with the class concept, of which more will be said in the next chapter, will denote various combinations of terms. Initially, the is omitted, and will be considered separately in the final part of this chapter. I will therefore follow Russell and initially focus on the remaining five words. Russell says in section 58 that the six words should be sharply distinguished from each other. This he does. Russell provides certain strict and technical interpretations of these six words. However, we have to understand that the way that these words are used in a strict and technical sense may not exactly correspond to their use in an informal setting. 
those with some experience of mathematics will probably have some familiarity with these words in various contexts and will probably be quite comfortable using these words appropriately in those contexts. However, it may only be worthwhile up to a point to try to understand the meanings of these words in a Russellian sense by comparing Russell's technical interpretations of these words with their use in everyday or informal mathematics. Russell also comments in a footnote to section 59 that I intend to distinguish between a and some in a way not warranted by language. Therefore again, we may only be safe up to a point trying to compare Russell's use of these words with how these words are employed in an informal setting. It may seem that sometimes there is a distinction being made without a difference. Even if we don't fully agree with Russell's technical interpretation of these words, and possibly if we don't see things the way he did, I still think it's important to pretend to accept Russell's interpretations to a certain degree if we're to successfully understand what he's trying to do. The five words, of course excluding the, are given the following interpretations by Russell, and Russell also gives some examples to illustrate the meanings of these words in various contexts, and I think that the examples are well worth reading because they do seem to really help, rather than relying purely on the technical explanations given in section 61. The first case, which corresponds to all, is called a numerical conjunction, and in the next chapter this will also be called addition of individuals. All A's denotes effectively the collection or class of A's. The second case, every, is called propositional conjunction. And in this case, each A is separately denoted and is called propositional conjunction because it corresponds to the notion of logical products of propositions. Note that in the previous case, there was a conjunction of terms rather than a conjunction of propositions. Conjunctions of terms are fundamentally different from conjunctions of propositions. The third case, any, is called variable conjunction. This denotes some certain combination of the terms a1, a2, a3 and so on, such that whichever a we happen to choose is not specifically denoted, but whatever applies to any a, we can be sure must also apply to the a that we happen to choose. Russell describes this as somewhere between a conjunction and a disjunction. The fourth case, a, is called variable disjunction. This case again does not denote any particular a. A proposition which is true for an a may be false for some of the a's and this will depend on the specific proposition. And the fifth and final case, sum, is called constant disjunction and corresponds to the logical addition of propositions. I found the examples alpha 2 and alpha 3 to be particularly useful in coming to an understanding of the notions of an A and some A in the Russellian sense. Russell says, It is to be observed that these five combinations yield neither terms nor concepts, but strictly only combinations of terms. The first, all, yields many terms, while the others yield something absolutely peculiar, which is neither one nor many. He also says that the combinations are combinations of terms effected without the use of relations. And it may be noted that the words all, every and so on may in some contexts give rise to equivalent propositions even though different words may be used. However, different words which give rise to equivalent propositions in some contexts may give rise to genuinely distinct propositions in other contexts. Thus the words are not necessarily always applicable in the same way with exactly the same interpretations in all contexts. Indeed, Russell says, although it may often happen that there is a mutual implication, which has not always been stated, of corresponding propositions concerning some and a, or concerning any and every, yes, in other cases, there is no such mutual implication. Thus, the five notions discussed in the present chapter are genuinely distinct, and to confound them, may lead to perfectly definite fallacies. Russell in section 59 asks whether the six words all, every and so on denote six different kind of objects or whether there are six different ways of denoting. He concludes later in the chapter that it appears to be that the way of denoting is always the same and the difference lies in the objects that are being denoted. Towards the end of this chapter he moves on to the. He says the word the in the singular, is correctly employed only in relation to a class concept of which there is only one instance. 
Russell picks out the word the as being of particular importance since it allows to assert identity in a non-trivial way. Russell says in section 64, When a term is given, the assertion of its identity with itself, though true, is perfectly futile. But where denoting concepts are introduced, identity is at once seen to be significant. In this case, of course, there is involved, though not asserted, a relation of the denoting concepts to the term, or of the two denoting concepts to each other. One of Russell's classic examples of a non-trivial assertion of identity is Scott was the author of Waverley. In this proposition, we see an actual term, Scott, and a denoting concept, the author of Waverley. And in another example, in section 64 of the present book, we see an assertion of identity which involves two denoting concepts. The present Pope is the last survivor of his generation, where the denoting phrases are the present Pope and the last survivor of his generation. Both of these examples are non-trivial significant propositions. The idea of asserting identity in this way does seem to have some relevance to mathematics since it allows us to speak about, say, the solution to a certain equation without actually going to the trouble of finding and exhibiting the solution. It's often the case that it's known that a solution to an equation exists, though, for one reason or another, it may be practically impossible, or near enough, to obtain the solution. Therefore, we only have knowledge of the solution in an indirect way, and this may also be useful in situations where the existence of something is only known through a non-constructive proof. For example, a proof that relies on the axiom of choice. A much more thorough treatment of denoting is given in Russell's article titled On Denoting. Also, section 14 of the first edition of Principia Mathematica gives a formal treatment of descriptions where some interesting properties of descriptions are clarified. Some of the material from Principia Mathematica is or will be covered in another video on my channel, depending on when this video is completed in relation to that one. That brings us to the end of this video. In the next video, I'll be looking at the remaining chapters from part one of the Principles of Mathematics. If there's anything that you'd like me to clarify relating to the content of this video, or any other video on my channel, then please get in touch. Thanks for watching.